Welcome to Aloha Friday and Stan Energy Man. We're here today with uh, Robert Friedland from Proton On Site. He's President and CEO of Proton On Site. And uh, that's a big deal for us that do hydrogen here in Hawaii because um, the biggest electrolyzers that we use are PEM electrolyzers made by Proton On Site. We have one at Tickham that we, we've had out there for I think probably five or six years now. And then uh, Mitch Ewan has one over at County Marine Base servicing the the Marine and Navy. I think Mitch is a 12 kilogram a day and ours is 65 kilograms a day. So pretty good size industrial equipment. Welcome to the show, Robert. Thank you, Stan. Good to have you here. Thanks Great for traveling here. all the way from the mainland and, and foregoing all that nasty weather they're having over there on the East Coast so you could come here with your with your wife and have a little bit of a vacation while you're working. Exactly. And uh, thanks for being part of our working group yesterday as well. We appreciate you uh, making some comments there and, and bringing some insight. So Wonderful. Um, tell us a little bit about how you got started in doing things in hydrogen and how you got started uh, with Proton, making Proton happen. Sure, so, so Proton's gonna be actually 20 years old uh, in, uh, on August 16th, so just coming up shortly. And uh, myself and five other, or four others, founded Proton back in 1996. And mm -hmm. the majority of us came out of United Technologies where we were working on this technology for the military for breathable life support on submarines. Mm -hmm. And we saw an opportunity to commercialize it, uh, as you know, the, the hydrogen economy was only five years away at that time, and <laughs> some, some say it's still five years away, but, uh, but uh, we were able to go out and, and develop PEM electrolyzers for mm -hmm. commercial markets and, and grow the business and go through the ups and downs of being a small company. And, and today we were 95 people and, and, and doing pretty well and serving markets all over the world. We're in over 75 countries uh, with over 2,500 systems. And places like, uh, and, and equipment like we've placed on Hawaii is a big part of what we do. Uh, we're also in a number of uh, uh, commercial markets from semiconductors to heat treating to utility, power plant cooling. So some non-sexy markets, but, but important commercial base for the business to continue to, to grow and to thrive. So. Work with the Navy on their ships. Uh, any of your equipment is still on board uh, submarines. We've uh, we've had a, a, a contract with uh, United Technologies for a number of years, working uh, supplying. Uh, essentially, uh, they had contacted us about ten years ago to to bring our technology, our commercial technology, into the military realm. Uh, so much of the the work I was doing back at United Technologies is now at Proton. Oh, okay. So we've been supplying the cell stacks uh, okay. to them, and they supply the systems. Uh, and uh, that's been going on for many years, and uh, uh, we expect it to continue for a number of years to come with some recent awards that, that we've uh, been advised that we're getting. So uh, we hope to be on an IDIQ kind of contract and, and see this kind of go for another five or ten years. Terrific. I was talking to you a little bit before the show about um, the conference we had last week with Baycom, and during the beginning of the conference, they had some of the science and technology advisors talking about new technology and challenges that they have with them. And one of them was a special ops guy, and mm -hmm. he was a Navy SEAL. And he talked about how lithium batteries were great and everything, but he has one big problem. He can't get them on submarines because they're not certified to have lithium batteries. They're hazardous, and they can't take them on submarines. Even, mm -hmm. you know, in the, in the military, you know from working in United Technologies, they have incredible certification programs before they'll let anything on an airplane or a submarine because those assets are those capital assets are so valuable, you can't afford to risk them. So they're very risk adverse in, in certain areas. And I, I told the guy, I said, but you do realize that you already have an electrolyzer on your submarine making your oxygen, you're throwing the hydrogen away, and you could maybe put the hydrogen in some metal hydride storage containers mm -hmm. and use those instead of batteries. And it was like, bing, you know, I mean, hey, there's something we could look at because um, it's already, the equipment's already on the submarine. So. You know, right. a lot of what I find I, I end up doing is taking technology that's been around a while and just introducing people to different ways to use it. And, and it, it opens up whole new doors and stuff. But. Well, and that's really important in the military, especially because they get so fragmented in terms of what they're working on. And there are unmanned underwater vehicle activities going sure. on that are looking at fuel cells and different forms of, of hydrogen and how to do that. But piecing the whole thing together in terms of what assets are already on board, uh, you know, it takes people like you to help make that connections. We try to do the same thing. I tell people I'm not an engineer. I'm a fine arts major, but I can take the engineering stuff and draw a picture for you right. and help people understand it that normally couldn't understand the technology. Exactly. And being in the military for as long as I've, I've been, I had a, a technical life you know, in the military flying airplanes and stuff, so I was always exposed to all the engineers and all the technology. So it's a, it's 
kind of one of those things where I guess they just fit. But hey, tell us a little bit about where you think hydrogen is going in our country and even around the world. Um, I mean, obviously, we, we kind of alluded to it. It's five years down the road and it seems like it's always five years down the road. Are, are we at that turning point yet where hydrogen is going to take off and go? Yeah, and I, I think there's kind of, I look at that sort of in two ways. I think commercially, you know, hydrogen has always been, uh, commercial uses for hydrogen have always been uh, held back a little bit because it's very geographic. So we have in the United States a good supply of hydrogen delivered infrastructure, mm -hmm. uh, many plants around the U.S., similarly in, in Europe. Uh, but when you move into the Middle East or you move into South America or you move into China, there's not as, as good a, a delivered infrastructure. So I think we're finding now with the more of the commercialization of electrolyzers uh, from Proton and others that we're able to reach more people because hydrogen is a critical element in semiconductor manufacturing and heat treating and food processing and, uh, and oil and, refining, and, oil refining yeah. and, and, and uh, power plant electric generator cooling. So. People don't necessarily think about that, but we're actually being able to expand that uh, with the use of electrolysis uh, globally. On the energy side, it's really interesting because I think fuel cell vehicles are, are starting to move, uh, clearly in Japan, places in Europe, in California, in pockets. But you're seeing the need for the infrastructure to come up. Right. Uh, in, in places like the U.S., early on, that'll be met more with delivered, most mm -hmm. likely, uh, because it'll be more cost effective when the vehicle numbers are small. But over time, and with the drive to make it more green, you'll see more and more electrolysis. Mm -hmm. In Europe and on islands and in places in Asia, uh, you're already seeing a push more towards electrolysis, either because they have the excess renewable energy they can use, or they don't have the delivered infrastructure to be able to easily uh, get it there. In right. southern, you know, China's doing a lot with buses now, Japan's doing a lot with other transportation. So I think you're seeing it move. And I do believe it's, uh, while I think it's a couple of years away, I think it's actually starting now. Mm -hmm. So I think the clock has started. It's clearly the automobile manufacturers, Toyota has bet big on hydrogen, mm -hmm. um, and others like Honda and Hyundai and, and un, are following suit with a suite of products. And mm -hmm. uh, what we always do, or what I always like to also talk about is that electrification of the vehicle, because uh, people don't always recognize that a fuel cell is an electric vehicle. Right. And the drivetrain on a, on a battery car and a fuel cell vehicle are the same. Yeah, exactly. So they don't, they, they don't have to, they can coexist, mm -hmm. and there are uses for different things. And what's really nice, as you know, about the fuel cell vehicle is you fill it up with hydrogen. You know, I drive a Toyota 2007 fuel cell vehicle, have for five years. I fill it up at the station at Proton in three minutes, and I drive it 300, 350 miles. Mm -hmm. You can't, you're never going to be able to do that with an electric vehicle. Uh, that doesn't mean a battery electric vehicle is bad, as long as you can charge it and get the use out of it. It's good for short duration, um, but the electrification platform is opened up greatly when you bring fuel cells into the picture, and I think that's what makes it uh, exciting. I, I get into a lot of discussions, especially with battery people, because a, a friend of mine noticed last uh, month that it seems like hydrogen people like batteries, mm -hmm. but a lot of battery people don't like hydrogen. For some reason, it's really weird, but we understand that batteries are an important part of the hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle. Correct. But it seems like the battery people feel threatened by hydrogen as, as some threatening technology, when actually it's just kind of a range extender. It gives you a way to put more range on a vehicle that's an electric vehicle. And, you know, so I always end up getting in these, not arguments, but sometimes really terse discussions about efficiency. Right. And everybody always points back to, well, you know, if you're, especially if you're doing electrolysis, it's not as efficient as steam reforming, and, and it costs too much, and hydrogen's not going to pencil out. And, you know, I have a hard time fighting with that argument, but I say, well, there's other factors. Batteries aren't as transportable. You start putting 300 miles worth of range in a vehicle with batteries, you're lugging around batteries. That's right. all you're really doing is you have nowhere room in your car to sit. You've got two people and batteries. Um, so there's trade-offs, and some of it's transportability, some of it's hazardous material, some of it's safety. Um, so where, how do you enter the argument with these folks? I know you must get into the same mm -hmm. ones. How do you talk about hydrogen as a, as a clean technology using electrolysis for, for deriving your hydrogen? How do, you, how do you face those people and talk to them and, and try and talk sense to them? So, so first thing is I always talk about it. I never talk about it as the answer. I think and, and too many people talk about one, the silver bullet that solves all the problems. Hydrogen is part of a continuum that fits 
on a range extender, a small SUV, some of the things you talked about where if you're going to get to a bigger vehicle, you're going to be lugging around more batteries uh, and you just have a power to weight ratio that doesn't uh, Does make, make sense. sense. Yeah. And then when the efficiency argument comes up, I remind people that today you drive an internal combustion engine that's 28% efficient. You know, and we've in many cases, you know, dug the oil that's running the engine out of the ground in Saudi Arabia and driven it by boat all the way here to the United States. So uh, when you think about that, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Right. And I, I think it's really about, uh, in, in a lot of cases, it comes down to cost and mm -hmm. practicality. I think at the end of the day, if you build a product that people can, you know, if, if, the, if the general public can go and fill up a vehicle comfortably at a fueling station where they normally would buy gasoline in, a, in an experience that they typically would, would get from gas, then, uh, and it serves their utility, 300, 350 mile range, and it, um, then I think they'll buy it. And I think it's the kind of thing you have to put a product out there that people are gonna buy. And I think the efficiency thing, uh, uh, you know, people will, will say there's coming, well, people will often say to me, well, batteries are coming that are going to get you know, 200 miles, 250 miles on a charge. And I said, well, great, because the efficiency of fuel cells will improve and the fuel cell vehicles will get 400, 450 miles. So all you're going to do is continue to expand the range. And, uh, and then you look at transit buses and you look at other areas where you can begin to go, um, again, with the power to weight ratio, you allow for full electrification of the fleet, which is going to have a significant amount of batteries, but also open up opportunities for fuel cells. Great. Yeah, I, I do end up in those discussions with, um, especially with people who, who are really sold on lithium batteries. And I, I, I say, okay, why don't you go on the internet and find out where all the lithium is in the world, who mines it, where it is, because if it only comes from a couple of places, we're back in the same boat. We're going to the Middle East or North Slope of Alaska for oil, or we're fracking, or we're doing something for that energy that, by the way, we didn't make, we're just harvesting out of the ground. And, and you're right, the, the, the whole hydrogen electrolyzer piece, when I take people to see your equipment at Hickam, I say, okay, we're looking at a footprint of a regular gas station. It's, right. it's about the same size as a regular gas station, except in this footprint, we have the oil field, the pipeline, the tanker ship, the refinery, and the truck that delivered it to the gas station, all in one place. Tell me that can't pencil out to be more efficient when all that transportation is taken out of the system, taken out of the formula. Right. And people really, it makes sense to them. Then, they, then the light bulb comes on in their head and they go, you're right. I mean, so there's subsidies in oil. There's a, there's a lot that's put into oil right now that makes it as cheap as it is. But um, you want to get clean, start looking at electrolysis. So that's really our push here. You know, I'm, I work for a state agency that's promoting alternative fuel transportation. Mm -hmm. And so when I work with um, the uh, state, I'm looking for electrolysis and usually curtailed power because I'm trying to find inexpensive electricity to run my electrolyzer. And as Hawaii tries to get to 100% renewables on the grid by 2045, that means the, the more intermittent renewals we get, we're going to have to do something to store that energy. Mm -hmm. And there's batteries and there's hydrogen. And there's been a couple of national lab studies that say, you know, when you get to a certain scale, batteries aren't the answer. You've mm -hmm. got to have a mix of some other kind of energy storage besides batteries, because batteries are too expensive, um, especially life cycle. They're too expensive. They take up too much space. Uh, and when you accumulate them in close proximity, you have some high fire hazards that, you know, once the thing goes on fire, it ain't going to be put out. You're going to lose all the batteries. Right. Those kind of things that are taken into account. And electrolysis is one of the ways. How, how are some of the, I mean, are you seeing this around the world in Europe and things where they're, they're actually looking at hydrogen as an energy storage, a serious energy storage to solve intermittent renewables on the grid? Yeah, and, and I think, again, it's one of those kinds of things where it's in, what we try to do at Proton is position the technology in the areas where it has the best fit. Again, it doesn't fit everywhere. There are plenty of times where people will come to me with an opportunity to do something really, really small. And the answer is, look, if you're really wealthy and you want to create a project, we can do it. But if you're trying to put a system out there that's economical, use a battery because it's a much better play. But where you have a lot of power you want to store for a long duration, uh, then, and you have, especially if you have the ability to store it either in a salt cavern or you have tanks or some other way that, you're, that you know you can store it, then it really becomes uh, cost effective. I look at it sort of in energy storage, there's compressed air energy storage and pumped hydro. Those are two uh, large scale energy storage technologies that have been around for a long time. 
but you can only do those. You can only use pumped hydro if you have the geographical assets to use pumped right, hydro. Right. Same thing with compressed air energy storage. So we're seeing a lot of modalities come to play with the energy storage with electrolysis in, geogra in geographies that are islanded, uh, where, like Hawaii, but also in Southeast Asia and other places where it can really be beneficial to, to do things. Power costs are very high. And then the other places are where there's been significant penetration in renewables causing excess renewable energy and a lot of stranded assets like in okay. Germany and in other parts of Europe uh, and in China where they've built, you know, those are the two biggest places. China's got the most renewables in the world. So there's a, uh, a lot of energy that you can grab there inexpensively, create it to hi create hydrogen and then use that hydrogen either to make power again uh, when the renewable asset is not, when the wind's not blowing or the sun's mm -hmm. not shining or create an arbitrage where you take that to fuel and, and have a separate uh, uh, revenue stream. Okay. And we're seeing that industrially as well, where people are saying, well, I want to put this system up, but I'm going to take the gas and sell it industrially to a refinery or to a heat treater or two. And, and it's worth a lot more as an industrial commodity than it is as a fuel. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's part of this entire scheme where you have different vectors that you can use to, to uh, to sell that hydrogen and make break a return for the project manager for the project that it's created. Great, Rob. We're going to take a quick break here, and we'll be back to talk to Robert from uh, Proton on site and talk more about electrolysis and making hydrogen the right way. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science here on ThinkTechHawaii.com. I hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. to discover what's likable about science. Hi, my name is Kim Lau, and I'm the host of Hawaii Rising. You can watch me live every other Monday at 4 p.m. Aloha. Aloha, everybody. My name is Mark Shklov. I'd like you to join me for my program, Law Across the Sea, on thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, host of Sustainable Hawaii. Thanks for watching Think Tech this summer. We have a lot of terrific shows of great importance, and I hope you'll watch my show too every Tuesday at noon as we address sustainability issues for Hawaii. They're really pertinent as the World Conservation Congress approaches in September and the World Youth Congress that's focusing on sustainability next year as well. Have a great summer and tune in at noon every Tuesday. Hey, welcome back to my lunch hour. Stan, the energy man here, and we're talking electrolysis. If you don't know what that is, look it up. Actually, it's splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen. We use the oxygen for the medical folks or the welders, and we can also use the hydrogen for transportation or help them stabilize the grid. And to have, we have a professional here from the from the mainland, Robert Friedland from Proton on Site, who's who makes electrolyzers and uh, been doing it for 20, 20 or so years. Uh, got a lot of experience in it. We use this equipment out here in Hawaii. And uh, what's the future look like here in Hawaii for your, your kind of business, you know, the equipment that you produce? Yeah, so we're, we're very excited about, about things here in Hawaii. Uh, we've, we've, we've done quite a bit in fueling and, and expanding now to the Big Island with some of that. Uh, but we've also recently been working with Lamplighter Energy uh, on, on several different projects that are going in um, for renewable energy storage on a fairly large scale, which will take uh, advantage and use of our newest electrolyzer, which is a megawatt scale electrolyzer, which will be the biggest unit on Hawaii um, from an electrolysis perspective. And we're really excited about that because it's going to allow for some full scale uh, utilization and bringing, bringing that to places where they're going to take solar or stranded wind, or in some cases in Hawaii, hydro, electric um, energy, right. and utilize that to, to generate hydrogen uh, for creation, in a lot of cases, for power in the evening when the, when the renewable asset is not working right. or there's no sun shining. And, and there are developers out there like Lamplighter that are very um, forward-looking, that are writing power purchase agreements with clients and able to do the project with renewables and hydrogen and fuel cells. And in many cases, in their case, they're using wastewater cleanup as well. So they're adding in uh, purification of the water, which will feed the electrolysis. So mm -hmm. really looking at utilizing the assets within Hawaii to uh, create these systems. And it's also great here because, you know, this is a perfect example. As an island, energy costs are very high. Uh, renewable penetration has been pretty high. Mm -hmm. um, there's a significant military presence, which also 
um, is interesting in terms of some of the grid power types of things that, that, that they're looking at and you're looking at with microgrids. Uh, so it's, it, it's, it's almost to the point where if you can't make it work here, this is the kind of place where economically it should work. Right. Um, then you're seeing other places. It's interesting because you move from Hawaii and then you move into places in Southeast Asia where they don't have grids. So now you're standing up a grid instead of doing it the old fashioned way with a central power plant running wires all over the island, you're going to start with microgrids. Mm -hmm. so, so kind of a similar uh, situation to cell phones. If you're in a country exactly. that never had tele telecommunication, and suddenly you go in there, you don't bother stringing copper wires all over the place. You go in with cell towers, and everybody's got a cell phone, and you skip that whole technology that we grew up with where dial, we had push buttons and dials and stuff. Exactly. Same thing happening with hydrogen. That's exactly what's happening. And I think you're, you're, you, you need forward-thinking entrepreneurs uh, because they need to be able to write the right kind of deals because uh, you're not in the United States and they have to make sure that they can get the right credit and whatnot to, to put the deals together. But from a technology perspective and looking at it all as a microgrid, many times companies like Proton and others, we sell equipment. So we get tunnel vision in terms of if you want to buy a piece of equipment, here's that piece of equipment. It's really important now to be working with developers and engineering firms who are looking at the bigger picture because exactly. customers don't want, most customers don't want to assemble a bunch of discrete parts. They want a system and they want right. a solution. And it's hard for companies like Proton or other electrolyzer or fuel cell companies, some are trying to do it, but to really be that company writing a power purchase agreement, that's not what we do. Right. So you want to find partners who do that better and can write these and get the credit worthiness and stand up a project and make a return. They should be able to make money doing this and that's not a bad thing. Uh, and then we can supply the technology to be a part of that. And we think it's a, we think there's a really good future. Uh, we have projects pending in the United States. We have them in the Midwest. We have projects out here. We have projects in China, and we have projects in Europe. So we expect um, a number of shipments next year that are going to go to these various places, looking from bus fueling to wind energy storage to sun energy storage, and uh, pretty exciting stuff. Yeah, we we got a uh, call from one of our congressional offices here a couple of weeks ago asking us to talk to the U.S. ambassador to Costa Rica because they actually have a similar demographics to us. I mean, they're not an island, but they're, mm -hmm. they're the same size roughly as, as Hawaii and similar populations, uh, subtropical. The difference is they have a lot of geothermal and they have a lot of hydroelectric already. So they have very little solar and wind, but they have a lot of real good baseline power. Right. But they want to get into hydrogen transportation. So hopefully we're going to start a dialogue with them where we'll learn a lot about their geothermal, because we have geothermal here that we don't use enough of, and they want to get into hydrogen vehicles, and we're going to try and do some crosstalk with them and bring that up. But, you know, one of the things that I run into here, and we talked a little bit about it, is um, I, I make a joke. I say, you know, people in my, the next generation above me, if you take, talk to them about hydrogen, they say Hindenburg. If you talk to my parents' generation, they say hydrogen, they say H-bomb. If you talk to my generation about hydrogen, we go, can you snort it and get high? And then you talk to the kids and the kids go, hydrogen is great. You know, when are we going to start making our cars run off of it? You know, do you have those similar experiences yourself? Yeah, we've, we've had a program with, uh, with Toyota now where we've run a fleet of 14 of their vehicles for uh, on and off for over five years now. So we take the vehicles very often to different venues uh, as part of an education outreach program. And yeah, we see that all the time. If we go to venues where the average age of the audience is, say, over 40, uh, most of the questions we get are about the Hindenburg or about safety, safety or about, you know, you know batter why aren't batteries better? And they're sort of, I'll kind of call it negatively focused questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we take it to a high school or we take it to a bunch of college kids and it's all about, you know, why are we already not doing this? Mm -hmm. uh, it makes, they're not afraid of the technology. They've grown up with technology changing every day. Uh, they think that... Uh, you know, obviously, they're, they're geared more towards renewable energy and doing things cleaner and greener in many cases. Mm -hmm. So the whole concept of being able to not import oil or do those kinds of things is, 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 is almost obvious to them. So, Do you have any advice for us then to, to get the word out, the, the right word out? I mean, do you have a, a good trick or technique to get the, get the word out to everybody? Well, there's still very much a push. You know, I think I've been somewhat disappointed because, you know, we try to advertise in, 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 through the Departments of Education in a state where it's pretty small. I mean, Connecticut... In a lot of cases, I mean, maybe three and a half million people, but instead of a million in Oahu, but it's it's 
it's still geographically a pretty small state. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to get that pull where the science teachers want to engage us to, to really spread the word. So it's very much a push. You know, we do the Earth Day things. Right. And I think transit buses tend to be some of the best, or the shuttle buses like okay. they'll be running on the okay. Big Island. Those tend to be great because uh, people get on. Believing. Yeah, because yeah. you're on a bus yeah. and all of a sudden you're like, oh, wait, this bus is being run on hydrogen. So then you feel sick, you got off, you didn't have a problem, so yeah. you feel confident, and then the next time you see something about it, maybe you're not as nervous about it. Or you pay a little bit more attention to what's going on with respect to um, that technology. So I think those are a really good way to, to do things, and plus they solve a problem as well right. uh, in terms of uh, uh, transportation and, and, and getting conversion to, to hydrogen and electrification. Yeah, in fact, I was talking <coughs> to one of my colleagues uh, last week, and he said that in California, um, they, they talk to the transit folks there and there's people that actually will wait for the hydrogen bus and, and skip the other buses because they like riding on the hydrogen bus. It's quieter, the air conditioning usually works a lot better right. and, uh, and it's nice and smooth and people love it. So yeah, I think you're right on there. We need to get uh, focused on our, a little bit more of our fleet transportation here. And you know, along those lines, I don't know of anybody that manufactures hydrogen buses like right out of the blocks. So we always end up having to convert vehicles, and that's part of the challenge. Whenever we talk to like a local um, company here that wants to do tour buses, they got a hundred something tour buses, they want to convert them, and we go, okay, well, here's a company that does that. And it's like, okay, we can do three buses a year, and you'll have your fleet converted right. by the next millennium or something. I mean, do you think we're gonna get past that? Do you think Ford or, or one of those bigger companies is gonna, or, Gillig or somebody, one of the bus companies, is just going to finally break the code and say, dang it, we have to just start making hydrogen buses from scratch. Because then they'll probably be affordable. But when you got to tear the drivetrain out of a diesel bus and put in a hydrogen fuel cell system, that's a big challenge. Yeah, I'd say, I'd say fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you kind of look at the balance of trade issue associated with it, China is the one who's really stepping up. I mean, okay. you're really seeing China has done deals with Ballard on, on fuel cells, done deals with hydrogenics and on the fuel cells and are looking to put them into various sized 40 foot or 20 foot kinds of buses. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly for deployment in China, but I think w what they'll probably do is get, f like they've done before, is get further ahead and make it harder for, for the Fords and whatnot to potentially mm -hmm. catch up. But I do think there's room for, for more people in that market. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, if we can get them priced at the right, at the right level and they work, uh, so be it, I think. Uh, so, so you are seeing a little bit of that drive on, on reducing the cost. And I know the buses, which used to be $2 million a piece, are now under a million. So you know, you're closing the gap on a five or $600,000 diesel bus, but it's not, uh, it's not quite there yet. So they do need to do that. And hopefully more fuel cell manufacturers will stand up and do things like US Hybrid and some others that have uh, the technology to be able to do it. Well, believe it or not, we've blasted through a whole half hour talking about electrolyzers and hydrogen. I want to thank you again for being here and coming all the way from Connecticut to uh, spend some time with us. I really appreciate it and your input yesterday. That was, that was great. So uh, we'll have to have you back uh, in another couple months, maybe on my second year anniversary. And we'll, there you go. We'll talk about where we're at now with hydrogen because hopefully by then we'll be in the saddle and, and just galloping away down the sunset and in hydrogen uh, technology. So I'm looking forward to that. No, so it's thanks, great. Thanks for being here you're and welcome. good luck with uh, Proton on site. I, I know you're doing great things. And thanks for joining us with Stanton Energy Man. We'll see you next Friday here. Aloha.